Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth Art and Market Conference, Pivot the Southeast Asian Art World Beyond COVID-19. My name is Tsunang, and I'm the founder of the advisory firm Art, Asian, Art Agenda SEA, of which the conference organizer Art and Market is an affiliate. I also lead the sales of modern and contemporary art at the International Auction House Bonhams. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has meant that in the art world, the highly globalized cross-border movement of people and art has really grounded to an abrupt standstill. We're just beginning to recover into the so-called new normal now. No one can predict the future, but the much touted aspects of this new normal is somewhat scary and forbidding to us in the art world. Greater protectionism regarding jobs, enactment of borders, decrease in trade tourism. How do these affect us in the art world, particularly in Asia? I'm pleased today to discuss these points with three fellow art world professionals whose work in policy planning, cultural communications, and the logistics of art takes place mainly in the background, keeping the art ecology and the art market running smoothly. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge at this point in time, everyone in the audience, if you have a question to ask a panelist, you can type it out anytime in a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them at the end during the Q&A segment. Now, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our panelists. We have, um, now I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. We have uh, Catherine McClellan, President and Managing Director of the Hong Kong Office of the Multinational Cultural Communications Firm, Sutton. Hi, thank you. Good to be here. Good. Ida Ng is CEO, Art Move Halutrans Group, which is one of Asia's largest and market leading art logistics firm. Hello, Ida. Hi, everyone. Hello. And finally, Lo Ing Tiong, Deputy CEO at the National Arts Council of Singapore, which devises and implements arts policies in Singapore. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, Sunan, Catherine, and Ida. Good to meet you. Hi. Hi. Okay. And now I've asked uh, our three panelists to bring a beverage uh, to the panel discussion. And to start, let's toast to the perseverance and resilience of the art world in Asia. And here's to a great panel discussion. Cheers. 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 So I just wanted to start with a little recap of the past few months and uh, uh, Ing Tiong, let's start uh, with you. The government in Singapore through the NAC has uh, wandered very swiftly, you know, and admirably to the economic fallout of the pandemic with this multi-pronged holistic plan called the Arts and Culture Resilience Package. How has it been working in the eye of this storm to identify needs, create plans, budgets, and then make sure all the different constituencies can access these benefits, these packages. Right. Yeah, Tsunan, um, you know, this crisis or this pandemic, um, as we all know now, is uh, uh, unprecedented, right? And um, I still recall that uh, at that time, the, at the start of the year, we usually have a very major event that the uh, NEC drives, which is the Singapore Art Week. And, uh, you know, many of you are involved, you know, either it's very familiar with. with. And I still recall we were like, the, you know, uh, putting up all the events we have, uh, usually in Art Week, we have almost 100 over events, big and small, for all the grounds up. And uh, we also have um, so-called major exhibitions that were launched, and as well as uh, C-Focus that's organized by STPI uh, for the second time, uh, you know, so which is a kind of a, a platform, a commercial uh, platform that gathers some of the best uh, Southeast Asia art galleries here. And when after we did all that, I still recall the, the day where uh, the period of Art Week end, ended on the uh, 22nd of January. And then uh, right on 23rd, we then had the first uh, ministerial task force announcement that actually come, that, that told us that actually uh, we actually had COVID has hit Singapore. And, and from that point onward in January, you know, we all know that our all our lives has been kind of absolutely disrupted at that point. At that point, and when it all started, um, we were kind of no one knows any better. We are all trying to grapple the issue, and, and actually, when it started from what we what was actually predominantly seen as a health and health 
concern, health and safety issue in the beginning uh, to now we know it's not just a health and safety issue, it's a fully impact on the economy one. And in the, in the beginning stage, as a, as a policy planner and as a National Arts Council, of course, we were working on uh, kind of working with our arts community and arts industry, how to put in the safe uh, distancing measures, how to operate within the kind of new constraints in the beginning stage in the February, March. And of course, when we enter into March where circuit breaker was announced, and then of course, then the extension of circuit breaker over two months, uh, the, the whole impact is, is again a, a different one. And we know that uh, it has to very much not to just about safety and, and health. It is uh, very much how do we all have to survive uh, this uh, crisis that uh, has a severe impact on the, the whole business operation and the economy. So from then we shifted and our most immediate concern then was uh, aligned uh, as what the larger national concern uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation is that how do we protect the livelihoods of the individual artists and practitioners? So that was utmost of our concern at that point when we know that when we go into circuit breaker, breaker everything was shut down. There's no activity, meaning there's actually no form of, kind of income or work for, for everybody. So livelihood of the practitioner was big, was our major thing that we had in mind. At the same time, how do we preserve the capacity of the industry, not knowing how long this thing is going to last? And um, so we went into a lot of the, uh, the, the designing of the policy on how to respond to actually achieve these two things. And at the same time, we had to take a we have to take a very ecosystem view, meaning to say that we are just not concerned about the artists and individual practitioner who, whose kind of production uh, of work is being disrupted. We have to take the whole ecosystem view, meaning that all the adjacent industry, the supporting industry, to so be it art logistic, the gallery system, the commercial gallery system, and uh, even the other people, the writers, the, the, the curators, across the board, how would they be impacted? You know, so um, we, while we have schemes to develop to, to look at how to support the individuals, we also then need to look at see how we can help to support the capacity of the industry, uh, particularly uh, com us companies as well. And then at the same time, while we are trying to tackle this immediate concern, you know, how companies are going to manage cash flow, uh, whether how they're going to keep the jobs of their, their employees and how they're going to adjust their business uh, cycle. We also know that um, we can't just roll out schemes to address the immediate concern. We have to take this opportunity to say that while we are finding ways to support the, the practitioners and the, industry, and the companies and the industry, how do we at the same time make use this opportunity to prepare them better in terms of whether is it upskilling and acquiring the necessary skills that in time to come when we enter into this whatever situation the new normal you may call it that they are in a better position to then write on it so that has been how we have done it and more importantly along the way um, even though time was very tight and we have a very very short timeline to design policy schemes to roll out and support. We, we, we knew very well that we must do a lot of engagement and we actually went to have a lot of engagement session. And, and then thankfully with the help of technology like Zoom, we were able to have many uh, engagement sessions to actually meet with the arts community, the art industry people, uh, to talk about their, their concerns and needs. And then we tried to kind of incorporate into the policy design and the schemes design um, as quickly as possible. So in this way, it's not just, we kind of just roll out things very quickly and in a, in a timely way. We actually are kind of journey along, in a, on the same journey along with the, with the arts community and the arts industry. And I think in, in that respect, I, I must say that the Singapore arts community industry has been very um, uh, responsive in, in kind of working with us. Um, and when we asked for data, asked for information, they were very ready to, to share that. And um, kind of that, there was this kind of kind of trust that uh, we were there to support each other to to roll out. And with that, we could practically design and and uh, a scheme, for example, within a week, and actually rolled out and actually disperse application and grant scheme within less than two weeks from the point of announcement. 
And uh, from I having worked in policy making and administration of green for a long time, this is by far to me the fastest we have ever kind of put something out and uh, make sure that it, the the needs and the, the the funding and the resources gets to the uh, to the to the one who really needs it in a, in a, as short a time as possible. Indeed, and I think we'll come back uh, to some of the uh, features of this package, particularly digitization, at yes. a slightly later point. Let's um, let's turn to you, Catherine. Um, you know, with the sort of double whammy of the pandemic and the protests in Hong Kong, the past year has uh, really been I think, uh, tumultuous, challenging years for the art scene in in Hong Kong. That comes after a period from like what 2014, 2015 onwards of really exponential growth and development. And but things right now don't look to be settling at this stage with the unfolding political backdrop. Now, what has been the impact on the art scene in Hong Kong? In a short term, what do you think the scene will look like in the second half of 2020? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one. And, and as you say, it has been um, a, a, quite a challenging time um, for the art scene here in Hong Kong for multiple um, different reasons over the last year. Um, and, you know, that sort of, you know, impacts on, on everyone across with galleries, museums, um, or companies, you know, such as Sutton, we're working on the communication side, but across many different projects um, are here in Hong Kong. So, yeah, it has been a challenging, um, and it's in interesting listen listening to Entong talk about how, um, you know, the Singapore Art Week took place, and then sort of COVID-19 struck the day after. I think we were slightly less fortunate here in Hong Kong, obviously, um, you know, sort of Chinese New Year, sort of people on, on holiday, um, and immediately we're sort of uh, working from home, and under a certain sense of lockdown um, in Hong Kong. And as, as you guys know, um, March is our biggest art month of the year. We have Art Basel coming in, sort of the international projects, events, lots of regional, um, you know, travel as well. So for us, we were, and you know, and our business is also, you know, a lot of it's founded on, on that moment. So we were sort of gearing up to our usual March moment. Um, and sort of everything stopped in its tracks. So, you know, it has, that has probably been the, you know, one of the biggest impacts here. Um, but I think, you know, there is a sense of resilience um, and collaboration and an entrepreneurial spirit um, to Hong Kong. Um, there are, you know, we, I think in terms of the pandemic itself, everyone reacted very, very quickly here. Um, took it very seriously, you know, mass social distancing, working from home. We worked from home immediately uh, for, for many months and, and were able to communicate and continue um, all our support for the clients. So that's helped to really contain the situation and it's allowed the, um, the gallery scene and museums here to reopen um, quite swiftly, really. Obviously travel, you know, people can't fly into Hong Kong, so it's all about local audiences and opening opening here in Hong Kong but um, it was I think maybe three or four weeks ago we um, opened a, a, a huge Bazalit show with Gagosian uh, in Central and it was you know very popular lots of people coming um, all this health and safety precautions there but actually you know we're able to sort of see art in real life again which is which is good and I think you know the longer term prospects obviously there's you know there's there's still there's still a challenging scene here and um, you know, the global, you know, impact of the pandemic and other factors will continue to be, you know, a challenge for us um, in the short term. But yeah, as I say, there's a certain resilience in Hong Kong. The arts community here is very strong um, and supportive of each other. So, you know, even today I went down to, there's a new art fair called Unscheduled, um, a pop-up art fair in, in Taekwun, which is an incredible um, heritage space in Central, um, recently opened. Um, and the art fair was just organised by the local galleries here, the Art Gallery Association. Uh, was sort of, you know, what, what can we do here in Hong Kong when the bigger, the bigger players aren't able to travel in? And um, it's fantastic. So, you know, everyone there sort of excited to see each other, excited to talk about art. So I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm positive. I, you know, I think Hong Kong's got a great um, resilience and we've got some exciting things to come, come up uh, this year in the art scene, yeah. I think definitely uh, these kind of grassroots activities and um, ideas born from the ground, uh, coupled with what Ing Tiong has uh, earlier said, you know, from effectively top-down, uh, short-term, long-term mm. 
policy planning, um, a combination of it, uh, I see it as something that helps to uh, helps us to get the scene back on track in that sense, uh, coming out of this. Now let's turn a little bit to the background of things. Um, Ida, the logistics of art, you know, it takes place oftentimes in the background. And, you know, as we see the pandemic shutting down museums, galleries, uh, art fairs, these are the obvious sort of victims. Uh, the impact on logistics is often overlooked. Your art moving exhibition related businesses, I assume, you know, rather severely impacted. But are there aspects in geographical areas in your business, perhaps, that you think have stood up well in this time? Um, I think for us itself and Hello Trans, I mean, thank goodness that we kind of diversify into different areas. So other than handling exhibitions, uh, handling galleries, art fair itself, uh, one of our biggest source of income is actually from storage. So uh, storage is something that whether it's good time, bad time, people need, still need to store the work. So it, it stood up very well during this pandemic itself, and uh, that's our saving grace for having storage. Yeah. And what do you think is the future for art logistics in a world that is, at least for now, you know, predicted to be very deglobalized, very fragmented, having more closed borders? How does it actually manifest when it comes to the movement of art, which is, of course, a fundamental process in the art world? Well, if you look at the present trend right now, uh, with so many flights that uh, stopped flying, even though I think uh, CX and SQ just announced that they're going to resume the passenger flight on 50% capacity, but um, there's still a lot of restrictions right now. I think China, for example, is still one flight out per week to one destination per country. You know, so definitely we're going to be restricted a lot in terms of moving the artworks around. And uh, the impact for this pandemic for our industry itself right now, what we can see is a lot of small places are going to close down. And the bigger players is going to um, stay on, you know, and you can see a lot more uh, changes in the industry itself with without a lot of the weaker players, uh, with the big boys dominating the market even more. Mm. Right. Patron, I wanted to uh, uh, circle back to you. Now, in your work with uh, art institutions across uh, Asia, not just in Hong Kong, do you see any kind of um, new values, uh, positions that will be taken or emphasized coming out of this pandemic, um, either on an individual level with people or articulated already at an institutional level? Yeah, I mean, I think things, you know, might take a bit of time to trickle through more on an institutional level, but I think certainly um, that sense of connectivity and connectedness has been been really important. And I think, um, you know, you know, to go back to sort of the Art Basel moment here in March, that's the time when we often meet with people in person and, um, you know, do a lot of planning for the year ahead and kind of talk to talk to clients and talk to sort of uh, friends in the industry. Um, and not having that sort of moment of connection, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of quite a challenge. And I think it's made people adapt quite quickly. Um, and, you know, things such as this, you know, this Zoom platform um, has allowed people to sort of stay connected and, and it has become a really important thing. So I, I feel the turn to digital is obviously, you know, been one of the main, um, main approaches uh, for many galleries, museums, um, and, and organizations. So to stay connected between on an individual personal level to keep in touch, but also to sort of continue to reach audiences and, and um, for some programming elements still to continue um, for different sectors of, uh, of the audience, yeah. And, and Ing Jung, you know, yeah. unlike the more visible parts of the art world where you can look at, uh, say, in my world, auction results. Um, you can look at the cancellation of artwork activities, decline visitorships for mm. institutions uh, to trace the effect of the pandemic. Uh, I would say the impact of policy work is oftentimes less obvious, uh, at least to an outsider like myself. As an insider, can you fill us in on this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you're right. Um, a lot of policy work is obviously very behind the scenes. But I would say policy work is not abstract in nature. Because policy work, policy must lead to actual outcomes, must actually impact on people's life. 
And um, the big question is always how we measure the impact and how we quantify the outcomes. And that is uh, something that's uh, always uh, quite a bit of challenge. And, but um, what we have done is that um, we have already actually in just in the last few years, at least in any in the National Arts Council in Singapore, we have already constantly been um, looking at this uh, issue of um, how do you really um, ascertain in terms of arts and culture development, how does your policy really say uh, grow the audience, for example, how does it really nurture the, the, the talent of your, uh, your, for your artistic community? Um, all those kind of issues. What is the real value of the arts and culture in the life of the people? And we have been, um, over the years in National Arts Council, been conducting a lot of these kinds of research on that. And from that kind of research, we actually have been able to distill on, on things that uh, how we can then make sure that whatever kind of policy design that we roll out, that we are able to sufficiently measure Measure not in terms just of the very quantitative uh, numbers, right? It's not just uh, that kind of just numbers alone, but qualitatively, that policy, our policy, um, can actually really lead to um, uh, real work. Now, maybe I give a very example now in, in terms of now this current situation. Um, as you know, we were very determined to um, in Singapore to really make sure that, as I said earlier, protect the livelihoods and uh, ensure that the, uh, the self-employed person, which many of them are freelancers in the arts industry, and as well as uh, us coming, how do they, uh, whether indeed, how can they be uh, protected and sustained? So in a lot of the policy that we do now, in a lot of schemes that we do now, we, do for, uh, we are very clear in terms of what are we, we, we actually um, put it upon ourselves to make sure that we, when we brought out a scheme, we, are, we want to know how many, for example, jobs or gigs that we have created that really goes to the self-employed people. We actually look into that. It's a very concrete way. We must know that the amount we need. So when we formulate and when we had the, when we managed to get the support of the government to give us the arts and culture resilient package, and this is, which is uh, worth $55 million. And that is actually on and above nationally what actually we roll out to the whole industry, to the whole population as a whole. So the, this one is a specific separate package that we um, are given to the arts and culture community because we know that the arts and culture is important and needs the extra support to, um, to sustain itself. So, um, so we have to then make sure that um, we are able to explain the outcome. So that's one example I give you about the kind of jobs livelihood, how we protect this one. But at the same time, because as you know now, a lot of things are, uh, while we are fighting this and a lot of things are being um, delivered and presented online, we are also taking this opportunity to find out a lot more about what is the kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of consumption of the art, so to speak, that's out there digitally. So we are also then so-called writing on, if you may say, during this crisis to make the best of it and then try to find out and learn a lot more about this whole thing that we have always wanted to learn about digital consumption, about how do, do, do new audience really grow out of this uh, so-called um, digital online consumption to then eventually um, actual support and consumption for the arts. So yes, so while it might seem to others that uh, it's not so, so obvious, but uh, we certainly hold ourselves and we have very clear outcomes that we are driving and then we measure ourselves against uh, to those outcomes. A, a, a related point to this, and I uh, had a discussion with Vida earlier, you know, uh, some months back, I think, uh, about this. And then uh, in preparation for this panel as well, we talked about this. Um, the, the, the training that uh, um, people, in the, people working in the art world would like to receive. Uh, either you've been uh, training your staff during this sort of uh, down moment uh, in, in, in the business. Can you tell us a little more about this? Uh, yes. Uh, the moment when I had to do a self-quarantine when I came back from China, that was back in February, I sense that something is not right. And then with the Art Basel um, announced that they're going to stop, you know, we knew that something has to be done within our organization itself. Uh, because what we are doing, as I mentioned earlier on, we have different segments of the business. So we have our exhibitions, I have my museum team, I have my gallery services, I have people who are servicing uh, private collectors. At the same time, um, what we want to do right now is 
we know the art fair might not be happening this year. So what is going to happen to that team itself? So we decided to do cross training and with the museum shutting down, the museum team is going to be, I mean, no activities is going to be quiet. So we're trying to train, cross train everyone so that they can prepare themselves better, no matter how the situation is going to come out next time. No, so right now we are uh, holding weekly Zoom meeting on different topics and the cross training itself doesn't limit to just my Singapore station. Uh, we are doing it across the board with four stations that we have. We have stations in uh, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai and Beijing. So we take this opportunity, the downtime to understand each other better, um, to know how the custom formalities actually work in China, which is a very complicated issue, you know, and at how museum functions. You know, so a lot of many different topics we have come out and one of the topics I share with you is also art knowledge. Because as a service provider in the industry itself, um, we always feel a bit inequipped, you know, not equipped itself in terms of talking to our clients. So what we are coming up with um, is mm -hmm. art appreciation, art knowledge classes, and also explain to them about the art ecosystem. You know, like NAC, you know, we work quite closely with NAC and what exactly does NAC do? Uh, in the uh, in the, in the whole uh, art ecosystem itself, uh, what is the function of a, a museum? What's the function of a gallery or auction houses? Because these are the clients that we have every day, but they might not understand what role they play in the ecosystem. So we are using this time right now to try to beef up everyone, so that when everything reopens, when the business improves, you know, everyone everybody is poised to uh, be ready to take up the new challenge. I think there's a great deal of hope in this, in that, uh, you know, individually as uh, employers, uh, as uh, businesses, we take the lead to, to deal with training of this mm. nature. And then top down, um, we also have uh, longer structural thinking that, that helps to retain jobs, upskill, as you say, into uh, jobs and, and yeah. capabilities. Now, yeah. of course, when you talk about, so, yeah, yeah. Of course, when you yeah. talk about capabilities as well, we we're thinking uh, uh, the 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 big word so far has been uh, digitization coming out of the pandemic. Maybe uh, either you, you can uh, continue on and tell us a little bit more the impact of digitization for the art logistics industry. Well, um, basically, there's nothing uh, traveling. There's no movement. Um, so for us itself is um, as much as we don't like uh, digitization, but I think it's a good thing. It's a good alternative. Uh, I, I believe it's going to stay on even though when the market reopens, when museum reopens, it gives everybody a different avenue. You know, um, I think the other day I heard one of the conversation uh, asking Basel whether they want to continue to have the online green room even though when they uh, uh, resume everything back to normal and the answer is yes, they're looking at it right now, you know. So because not everybody can travel everywhere. And there are way too many art fairs happening right now. You know, there's so many shows I want to see overseas, but because of the travel restrictions, I guess it's going to be a while before we can actually move to another, I mean, go to another country. So the digitization definitely is a good thing, but not working for us. You know, um, I, I hope that museum is still uh, going to have more exhibitions coming up because I believe people still need interactions. You know, art fair, other than just uh, a platform for dealers to sell the artworks, it's also like what Kathleen mentioned, it's a platform to meet people. I do the same thing too when I go to art fair. You know, so I, I hope that the, all these activities will resume by next year, uh, hopefully, and uh, then it won't impact my business so much. Yeah, we hope so as well. Now, Catherine, um, you know, this audience engagement uh, campaigns, events, uh, they all necessarily have to take a, I guess, a digital shade ever since yeah. the start of the pandemic. So, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, Gallery Weekend Beijing and how uh, you work in it mm. in a different way, remotely controlling. Or... Absolutely. <laughs> now, uh, do, you, um, do you see an enlarged audience as a result of uh, digitization? Do you think more people might come into uh, the art world in that sense? Um, yeah, yes and no. I think, I mean, something like Gallery Weekend Beijing was interesting for us. Um, we worked with them on previous editions and this year, um, 
you know, our teams in Hong Kong, well, normally we fly up there for the week, we'd be on hand, we'd bring in a press trip of media from across the region and internationally um, and have lots of international VIPs flying in for that weekend. So, um, you know, with the travel restrictions in place, the event taking place in May was really um, for the local audiences in Beijing. The galleries were open, but you know the visitors were all sort of local. Um, so that made the the team there uh, take on a more of a digital, digitally enhanced program uh, with the app and with lots of other kind of you know international talks um, and things like that. And from a communications perspective, it gave us a great opportunity to revisit how we've been doing things. You know, do we need to sort of fly in everyone to you know, experience that and what can we experience online? And, um, you know, I think, you know, what I just says and what, you know, lots of people I think are feeling is, you know, art, you know, it's, it's, it is at its best when we experience it in real per in real life because, you know, we all love being in galleries, museums and seeing art and, and you know, experiencing it that way. But, you know, we can also have a great um, understanding and appreciation and experience through digital platforms um, and we don't have to sort of just stop and, and, and you know, not, not experience it. So for Gallery Weekend Beijing, we organized a digital press conference, totally digital, um, on Zoom with the speakers. And it was quite interesting that the media um, that we invited, the media that turned up were really, you know, the top tier media that we would have put on a plane and, and brought in and looked after for three days. And, and they were the guys that were actually taking the time to log on, to ask questions, to see what was happening in Beijing, and then to write really interesting stories about, you know, what, what's happening. So, um, yeah, I think digital is here to stay. And I think when it comes to traveling again, we still will be thinking, can, is there a digital um, way we can complement this program? For anyone that can't make it or anyone that doesn't want to travel as much now so it's it's a really important tool and i think it can reach broader audiences um internationally as well so we shouldn't you know just go back to what we we're doing before we should definitely keep some of these new ideas um in play mm -hmm. yeah I, I totally agree um in term, you know the the nac has actually prioritized digitization uh in, in the arts ecosystem, yeah. uh, blueprint uh, we call what uh, RS RC, plan? Uh, RS plan. Yeah. 2018 to 2022. 20, 22. Right yeah. in the middle of it, yeah. even before the pandemic, actually. So this was yes. fell out two years yeah. ago. Uh, can you just fill us in a little more on this, and and how has the sure. pandemic perhaps accelerated this plan? Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I actually, I, I'm on the same, um, I, I echo um, and I, the point that Catherine and Ida made about digitalization and that digitalization is uh, for here to stay. Uh, but I will actually go a step further. It's not just only here to stay. It's going to permeate any, uh, every aspects of the way we obviously live, the way we work and um, the way we entertain ourselves or consume, you know, all, all aspects of life, but not just there, but actually playing, kind of permeating in all the roles, in all your, probably your business operation from the, the, the front end to the, to the back end. So it is, it's even more. And I, and interestingly, um, as you pointed out in our SG Arts plan, which we launched in 2018, we identified digitalization as one of the eight priority areas that uh, we need to focus on and turn all our resources in those areas to drive those areas um, and uh, in the next in the next five years to leading to 2022 and we actually uh, and I must share that the, the reason why that came about was before COVID everybody knew that technology is a great uh, is a major disruptor but also a great enabler everybody knew that right because people, you know, you, a lot of theories have been talking about it. And you see people are kind of adopting technology to transform, to increase productivity, to, to even ways to reach out to audiences and all. And, but the adoption is in, but they, in the art industry, you know, could be a lot more. So we come from the point to sort of advocate that, you know, digitalization is important, is a great enabler. You, we need to move into it. We, uh, we actually then, we have to then nudge people to think more about digitalization, more about the technology, whether you are in art creation or you are uh, art presentation or you are distributing 
uh, art. Uh, but with COVID, it's no longer just a disruptor. As I said, it is going to be in every part of uh, what we do. And I actually, you know, I, I don't claim to have any hindsight because we are still right in the middle of this. And yeah. interestingly, we are going into now the midterm review of this arts plan. And if I, there's one thing I say that I wish we could started a lot earlier about the drive to go digitalization. Because if whatever things that have, we have learned, one major thing that we have learned the, in the, this crisis so far is that if we had been better prepared or if we, or if companies or uh, arts industry has uh, kind of right on technology a lot more, right? And, um, and have the more of the know-how, um, then I think they would have been able to uh, respond a lot faster to in, the whole, in, in this whole situation. So I have observed that some who are more advanced will, will be able quickly to adapt. Uh, some struggle a little bit, some then quickly learn and, and, and also move on. But uh, essentially, we, everybody knew that we, we still have a lot um, more to learn in this area. And, and that's why we also have put out schemes like um, the capability development for the art scheme, which focuses on allowing all companies and individuals to actually go for, we have, we have listed numerous programs on digitalization, uh, whether is it using digitalization to better ma do marketing or to create a new platform or, you know, in different, in different skill set, we are actually encouraging all companies and uh, to, to uh, tap on the scheme and then as what Ida, like what Ida said for her company, take this downtime to send their staff to acquire those necessary skills. And this scheme is still ongoing. We actually, and I, I just want to say, I was very glad to see quite a number of our, particularly in the visual arts uh, scene, uh, quite a number of our commercial galleries actually sending their, their staff for some of this training and tapping on this grant. And, and we're more than happy to support that. So yes, it's not just, it's yes for here to stay, but more importantly, I think it's going to be in every aspect of the way we we work, and I think those who are able to uh, adopt and use technology to help transform their business uh, operation will be the one that will be able to ride it out and uh, emerge in, in the in the later past. Yeah, yeah, we're we're definitely seeing these kind of uh, reform art world. Uh, the the very salient aspects of it uh, is changing. Um, and now I think it's a very good time for us to uh, uh, take a quick dive into talking about environmental, social, and governance concerns, ESG concerns, which has, uh, I think, been a um, growing, growing uh, matter in the, in, in the art world uh, and in general in the business world. And I just want to uh, run this uh, set of concerns to each one of you uh, and how, you know, uh, in your own world, this has uh, come out. So perhaps either you can um, take us through uh, ESG concerns in your world first. Okay. Um, being in the logistic industry, I think we are the most unenvironmental friendly companies around. We have like disposable wooden crate, one-time use, plastic shade, you know, um, but what we are trying to do, and we have been doing that, is to do our part by recycling these materials. You know, we, we recycle our, our wood, you know, to make sure that it just, doesn't just go to the dumpster itself. And in terms of uh, social responsibility, um, I think what we have been trying to do is to give back to the arts, uh, the, the arts community, you know, um, as you might know, I have an art space in Singapore. You know, the space itself is a very good uh, venue to hold a lot of different type of art activities. Uh, so what we intend to do is to open up the space, you know, work with uh, individuals or different uh, companies who is interested to uh, bring the shows into our space itself. You know, because I think right now working, uh, a lot of the music, sorry, a lot of the galleries comes paying rent. As you can see, some of the galleries have ceased operations uh, in human barracks. So uh, we would like to take this opportunity to offer the space to them and give them another avenue, uh, other than just a digital platform itself. They can still show the artwork, you know, through the space uh, as one of the way to give back to the community. 
And in terms of the gov uh, governance itself, this is something actually is inbuilt in our philosophies, in the company's uh, beliefs. Uh, what we are doing is uh, a lot of the, from taxation to uh, government policies itself, um, there's a lot of compliance required by different authorities. So what we have been doing is uh, uh, we want to stay above board, make sure that every single stations that we have is uh, complied to the local or international um, authorities in terms of import export. I think that's very, very important because um, there are companies out there who's doing some funny business. And for us itself is we want to make sure that uh, we say no to the client, you know, and at the same time, uh, we also ISO certify. So compliance to us is a uh, very important uh, issues in our daily life. Yes, of yeah. course, of course. Yeah, so it's not whether COVID or not. I mean, it has been around, uh, but it's just getting more prominent right now in the nowadays world. Mm. And of course, uh, you know, uh, Catherine, uh, in, in our uh, individual phone discussion, we, we talked about shifts in work mode, uh, principally the reduction in carbon footprint as a mm -hmm. positive side effect of the pandemic. Now, uh, I'm just thinking more the social governance aspects. In, in the certain imagination, what would a 21st century public art institution in Asia look like? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's many, many different aspects to, to consider on those, on those elements. Um, as you say, we did talk a lot about this the environmental impact of, you know, the way the art world operates and for us, you know, traveling a lot and, you know, the, the planes and the carbon footprint. But on a sort of social and governance level, I think, you know, there are, I think these sort of issues have become um, more to the fore and a spotlight's really been put on them through the, the current situation because, you know, everyone is sort of, um, you know, really thinking about how they're running business, how they, you know, they want the business to survive a tough time and, and the sort of social aspects that are sort of included within that. So, I mean, I think for us, we've been thinking a lot about diversity um, at the moment within our company. So we have our office in Hong Kong, which is, um, you know, our, our sort of team is incredibly international, so you know local team members, team members from across Asia, but we also have offices in London and New York as well. So um, we're really thinking about diversity and how we recruit people and how we go outside the normal channels of, of the art world and kind of diversify our workforce. Um, and we've also been thinking a lot about wellness and mental health um, because you know, and especially at this time, those issues are, are incredibly important. Staying connected and looking out for team members, and you know, we don't always. Um, you know, everyone's sort of in different areas around around the city and, and thinking about how we can look after them. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, as Ida said, we've, we've always run the business here in, in very responsibly and, and in line with all, all necessary um, sort of government, you know, guidelines and kind of, we are a sort of, you know, respected international company for that reason. And, and our clients, you know, are, you know, range from, you know, people like UBS down to sort of, you know, grassroots sort of artists or, um, you know, foundations, organizations like that. So we have to be compliant across all those levels um, and have the right policies in place. Um, and it's kind of my role in, in Asia to make sure that that's, that's happening and, and we're kind of compliant. So... Um, they're always important, but I think the last few months have really, you know, made us look at those and make sure we're, we're kind of doing things the right way. Is it the same experience for you, Inkyo? Uh, do you feel like maybe yeah. in the last few months there's been more of this discussion? Um, well, <laughs> in the last few months, I, 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 I think we are grappling with a lot of the real uh, survival bread and butter issue. But uh, all along the scene, I guess in the art scene, and also from us, uh, from the from the aspect of me coming from the as as council, we obviously always will want our art, uh, our arts community and our arts industry to be um, environmentally and socially responsible, and um, we believe that uh, particularly the arts has a way uh, has can play a great role in advocating that, and that should. Uh, be something that uh, could on on practitioners mind on people who operate in the industry mind and you can if you can do what you can like for example some of the things that Ida share as a company how they try to mitigate the the the, the kind of uh, environmental concerns yeah. that they have in terms of the resources that they have to consume in order to in order to do their business um, I think it's important to then for us to always encourage and recognize everybody doing their part. So, for example, I mean, it may be a very small thing, like um, when um, 
uh, when C focus was organized, you will see that that uh, the wristband is actually a recyclable wristband, electronic wristband that uh, encourage people to then not just use it and throw, but to give it back and so that next year you could just reprogram it and then use it again. Uh, I, I said that because I remember having a discussion with Amy Yu, who is a SDPL organizer. He said, hey, why, why don't you print a year on the, wrist, on, the, on the ribbon of the wristband? He said, no, if you print it, then they can't recycle it. You know? so, so it becomes a nondescript wristband. Um, but but that's, a, that's a trade off, right? You know? So you less of the branding. Uh, but uh, it's something that's more environmentally friendly. But these are this just example of small things that I think we must consciously keep trying to do it. And, and, and hopefully over time, it will create a larger impact. Well, the issue of governance, I think is always our concern that uh, in, in, for us, because we always want to make sure that in Singapore, our businesses, our industry, or within the community, there's always strong code of ethics and governance uh, in, uh, operating uh, as far as possible. Because Singapore, we build ourselves on, on the brand of trust, right? We are, we are a place where we are the trusted place for business, for, for practices. And it's something that is very important to us uh, as a country. So uh, constantly, I think, well, it, as a council, uh, we, we may not be working very much involved in the so-called commercial kind of practices, but it's uh, some, something that we like to encourage to make sure that uh, there is good practices between, say, artists and, and their galleries and the galleries and their collectors. And um, as you know, in the art world, sometimes not everything is so transparent. Uh, but uh, I think we can move towards that. And in time to come, we need uh, industry leaders who uh, may come together and then kind of then work together and formulate some and strengthen some of these practices. Over this period, I think um, some of these, uh, uh, as you say, these ESG uh, concerns may uh, accentuate even more. Uh, but on, on the longer term, it's uh, something that uh, obviously we have, we have to uh, keep in mind. And hopefully this crisis, crisis doesn't push some of this uh, effort that we made in these areas kind of backward. In fact, we should then, kind of as we transform, right, move some of these issues forward in time to come. Yeah, plus please uh, make best use of the crisis. And uh, yes. yeah, I think that yeah. is the... That is the yeah. don't, don't, wait, don't waste a crisis, yeah. yeah. That's don't what we always say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very good point for us to... Uh, uh, open up at this point in time to put forward questions that have been posed to us uh, from our audience. Um, so just let us continue on this point first. Uh, we have a question from uh, Amir Veda Priyono and it's directed at, I guess, uh, uh, Ida. Do you think that there is any initiative to be environmentally friendly uh, in the in art logistics after this pandemic? I mean, we, we talked about some of the present practices you already have. Um, but I think uh, this is an even more forward-thinking question. And if yes, uh, what are some of these uh, measures, initiatives? Um, it is hard to be environmentally friendly, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, I mean, among the industry itself, uh, the society that I am representing, uh, sits on the board itself, we actually have a green committee looking at uh, how we can help to do our bit, to have to do our part. And even for the green committee itself, uh, we have a hard time, honestly, to come up with initiative or uh, different action plans. You know, uh, we can think of like, okay, we build how many creeks, we plant a tree. You know, this is some initiative we can do. But uh, definitely at this present moment, we cut down a lot of carbon footprint because uh, there's no more traveling. Uh, the flight itself, everything has stopped, or if not, we were very minimum operation uh, mode. So uh, that's the only thing I can think of at the present moment. You know, uh, I wish we can do more. Uh, we will continue to try. You know, uh, that's the reason why we set up this green committee to brainstorm and help uh, all this dream to come true, to realize all this, uh, yeah, all this dream to, to make sure that we can give back more to this to the environment. I guess in this way is actually not uh, uh, the the art world is not particularly culp culpable in that sense. I mean, everybody is uh, kind of trying to respond to the environmental agenda, and uh, um, it's it's become very much more uh, conscious for all of us. So I think we're just really at the beginning stages of trying to 
answer a lot of hard questions at that point in time. And uh, talking about hard question, um, we have one from uh, Carissa Lim, uh, and this question is directed uh, to Intel. Earlier, Ida had mentioned that one consequence is the, is the weakening of smaller players, dominant of uh, bigger players in the art scene. Uh, the, the strongest survive, in a sense, uh, uh, out of this crisis. Now, back to the question. In Singapore, it appears that one of the consequences is that major state institutions like the National Arts Council uh, is dominating the scene with its own program, with its own initiatives. How does this actually protect livelihoods, especially um, in the arts organizations or companies as they're all struggling to stay solvent um, and the state produces more? I'm trying to clean up the question a little bit this way. Sure. Well, uh, we, with the state, uh, usually as a, as a government agency, as a National Arts Council, we are always very clear that we are, we are not in competition with the industry. We are not supposed to. If there's, if, if there's, this, if there's ever no need for an arts council, I think that, that would be the, the day, right? Where basically the industry is self-functioning. Um, the market mechanism is, uh, in, it comes out nice equilibrium and humming along, uh, you know, and um, there is not sufficient grounds up, sub, whether public support and um, so on. Uh, is, is there. But the reality is we know we, we, we are not at that state, right? And um, so for a start, I think the council, we are very clear that uh, uh, where we don't need to go, we will not go there. You know, we, we, where we don't need to have our finger in it, we, we will not, we'll try not to. So we start on the premise that we are there to support, we are there to go where perhaps mark, there's market failure or where areas that um, it kind of need a boost you know, um, in a sense. In fact, for many, many years, um, even just before I even joined the council five years ago, for many years, the council has never, for example, in the realm, in the visual arts scene, has any particular kind of um, very direct uh, working with the commercial sector particularly. And, we, and, and certainly do not fund up, say, commercial gallery. But over the years, we have kind of shifted our position because of also feedback that uh, if you take an ecosystem view, and the ecosystem view where all of the players, be it public or private, has to come together and support the artistic production uh, in the best way we can. And, and then sometimes we have to actually work with the private uh, uh, sector people to, to, to maximize the kind of impact. So if so, very concretely, if an artist were to do a show in a in a commercial gallery, um, in the past, if I say no, because it's in a commercial gallery and it's a selling show, then I shouldn't fund it. I should step away from it because it's, it's best left to the market. I will only support shows when it's organized by an independent or non-profit space, and then. But then we know that our, for example, artists can't just be always presenting their work in an independent non-profit space, or in in museums, right? They have to have multiple avenues of reaching out their work. In fact, the commercial side is where most artists will get their support because that's where collectors buy their work and then they can sustain their practices because mu museums can't completely take on that role because there's just too many artists out there. So we realize that if we don't try to support the artist who is going to do that show in the commercial scene and yet actually sell and, and may not sell, right? Um, then we have to give their legs up and we are prepared to do it. If the day that's not necessary because the collectors are there and the artists, when they do a show, the collectors are going to go there and artists will get sufficient support. Galleries sufficiently get their part of the profit to keep going so that they can continue to support the artists. Then, then I think the, the state will, will never uh, move into it. And mm -hmm. so that's why even at this stage when we are, say, getting everybody to upskill, whether you're big players, small players, whether, for example, if you are, you are a company like Halutrans or a small gallery that's only five star, my, the amount of grant that we give you is actually the, is, is, is the same. It doesn't mean you're smaller. So, so I, I'm sorry, you know, you're, I know you've got many workers, I'm still only giving you that maximum that I can fund only that amount. And that amount is exactly the same as what will fund up a, a gallery of five people. So, uh, and, and, and so we, we are trying our best to um, 
not get in the way or in I think the case I think where the question probably alluded to is that inadvertently uh, or maybe some unconsciously uh, push out or or or, or uh, uh, some of the this one area. But we we are very conscious of that. But that that has always been how we have operated. And we, as I said earlier, uh, at this time, after this, we as we know, we are still right. We are still going through this whole this pan, this crisis. Uh, what comes out of it at the end? And we may not have a point where I say this is over and that that is it. We may we may take some time to reach that steady state. And of course, um, we are very NAC. We are watching very closely the industry. That uh, as I said, the the survivability of the companies and um, whether how many uh, we are able to support and make sure that uh, there is a substantial capacity that is preserved that they can continue to function. Uh, of which, without it, I think in time to come it will be just even more difficult to rebuild that. Yeah. Right. I think uh, staying on this uh, same topic of uh, uh, market forces and the hand of the government through uh, you know, state organs instruments, uh, we have a last question, I would say, from uh, Sarah. And this is directed to Catherine. Um, and of course, I think, uh, Ida, you might have an opinion on this as well. How will Beijing's new national security law affect the vibrancy of Hong Kong's art scene for art production and buying? This is, of course, uh, the big question out there. Absolutely, it's a big question. Um, and, you know, I think at this stage, uh, you know, it is a bit too early to really say exactly how, how that will um, impact the art world and the art scene here in Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, people may be concerned about it and artists are, you know, thinking about their future here. But, you know, Hong Kong has got a very strong, um, vibrant art scene. It's got a very varied arts ecology from artists through to, you know, the big commercial galleries. It's a major art center in, in Asia. Um, and there's many great things still, you know, ha you know happening. As I mentioned earlier, Tai Kun opening recently, the new art fair popping up today. We've got great things on the horizon like M Plus, the you know, long awaited new mu museum um, opening next year as well. So. I mean, it's hard to say how, how you know, that law will impact the art scene and many other aspects of, of life. Um, but I, I feel, you know, confident in, in the strength of Hong Kong's art scene continuing um, in, in the amazing different um, galleries, museums, um, art fairs um, and, and the different things being able to continue um, and, and enrich, you know, our lives here in Hong Kong and, and for the for everyone in the region as well, flying in to enjoy it in the future when people can come back. So, um, yeah, as I said before, I mean, Hong Kong's resilient and I, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm really positive about the, the future of the art scene here. Um, but for many different, you know, great art scenes across Asia, I'm looking forward to going back to Singapore soon, um, you know, for the, you know, the, the art events, you know, let, let's see when we can do that. But, you know, I think there's many great art scenes in, in Asia and Hong Kong will continue to be to be one of one of the strongest um, amongst many great, great places. Yeah. Right. Well, I totally agree with Catherine. You know, um, the way I look at it is uh, how the outside people perceive Hong Kong, you know, and with the national security law being passed, you know, definitely I will look at it is it creates stability. And um, this is something that is very, very important for people to go in and do business. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, wonderful. I think uh, that is a, uh, a great positive note for us to uh, end today's session. I want to thank you, Catherine, uh, Ing Tiong and Naida for all that you shared today and uh, everyone else for tuning in and spending the past uh, hour with us. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to join us tomorrow for the last day of the Pivot Conference when. Uh, Nadia will be speaking to three art collectors on uh, how collecting agendas might evolve. Uh, so do visit artandmarket.net backslash pivot for more information. And uh, cheers everyone for uh, having uh, survived today's session. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep safe, everyone. Yeah.